And a good Saturday morning to you. It's May here in Richmond, and this is, of course, Russ Barkley, Old Blue Eyes, back again for another research review. By the way, the results of my survey about dad jokes showed that 90% of those who responded to the survey approve of the dad jokes, but I'll try to limit them and not do quite so many for those of you who didn't care for them. And by the way, I do put timestamps in the description, so if you don't like the dad jokes, just skip to the first research article on that timeline and you can get started right there. Now, Let's take a few dad jokes that come to us from a new website I wasn't aware of. It's called dadblog.co.uk. So it's over in the UK. And here's a few dad jokes from that website. I used to hate facial hair, but then it grew on me. Ah, ha, ha. That's pretty obvious. Here's one for you. I stayed up all night wondering where the sun went. Then it dawned on me. Sorry about these pop-up ads. I'm trying an ad blocker, but obviously it's not working here with Google. And my last one for you is this one. I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know. Okay, let's get out of that real quick. Uh, Before we get into the research, I just want to answer a question that has come up occasionally in uh, my replies from my subscribers as well as in my email. And that is, what factors do I use in picking research articles to review. So here you go, very quickly. This is what I look for in deciding what to tell you about each week. First of all, is the sample size adequate to draw conclusions about the study? Uh, If it's not, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, Next, is the study design appropriate to address the topic at hand. So sometimes the studies are not very well done. Like somebody put five kids on horses and they had ADHD, not the horses, but the kids, and they took some measures before and after. That's just a ridiculous scientific design. In fact, it's not even scientific at all. So I don't use it. So how about this one? Is it likely to be of interest to you? I'm not gonna review research that is too basic or too technical that would take me a long time just to set up the review, having to explain what the study might be about. I don't think you're interested in that. I'm certainly not. And uh, I would rather talk about what is relevant. Also, has it been done on humans? I'm not reviewing any animal research. I also look for whether it's been published in a journal or not, or soon to be. And that assures me that it's likely to have been peer reviewed. I don't review student dissertations or master's theses that wind up being on the internet for that reason. They're published at their university's website, uh, but those are not peer reviewed articles. Does it advance our understanding of ADHD or its treatment. If it's purely a replication, which means it's probably going to be boring and it's been replicated many times over, I'm not going to talk about it. However, I might talk about replications that do advance our understanding in some way besides being replications. That is, they're important in some way, or they're very large and they suggest that the earlier conclusions that we had on much smaller samples and studies are very robust such as population-based studies. So uh, what I'm looking for then is, is the sample human as well? So let me get rid of that and let's get on to our research review here. Thank you for your patience. And our first paper is going to be on the genetic overlap between ADHD and chronic multi-site pain. Now this is a very, very large study that involved, as you can see here, several hundred thousand individuals, including many with ADHD, uh, as well as controls. uh, And they were looking at the overlap of the genetics, that is the polygenic risk scores for ADHD, and those that have been found to be related to migraine headache and multi-site pain. And cutting right to the chase, what did they find in this paper? They found that ADHD was in fact related to increased risk for multi-site pain 
and to a lesser extent to migraine. Now that finding about migraine headaches, that has been found previously in the literature. This study suggests that the link may have some genetic basis, meaning that the genes for one disorder are actually genes for the other disorder as well, or at least predisposed to that disorder. But basically this paper is showing that there is an underlying, underlying excuse me, shared genetic risk between ADHD and multi-site pain, and to some extent, migraine headaches. So a very nice paper published over in Biological Psychiatry, Global Open Science. As always, I do put the references in the description for the video. Next up is a systematic review and meta-analysis of predictors of adult psychiatric outcomes in studies of children with ADHD follow to adulthood. This, as you can see, was published over in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Very good journal, by the way. So this is a meta-analysis that found, as you can see here, 36 studies that had examined up to 119 different predictors. They, however, found that only about 10 predictors were eligible for analysis, meaning that they were predictors that were found across various studies. What did they find? They found that a history of being treated with stimulants actually increased the odds of having greater ADHD or psychiatric comorbidity at outcome. Now notice that being treated with stimulants increased psychiatric comorbidity at outcome. Now why would that be the case? because worse cases of ADHD are both more likely to be treated with stimulants and more likely to have comorbid or other adult psychiatric disorders at outcome. So uh, that explains that sort of link. You might think that being treated with stimulants would prevent comorbidity, and usually within the period of time the individual is treated, that might be the case. But here they're simply looking at whether you had been treated at any time in childhood or adolescence. Many of those people are not continuing with treatment into adulthood, which explains why they might still have psychiatric morbidity in adulthood. They found that people with higher IQs had decreased risk of psychiatric outcomes, they found that persistence of ADHD into adulthood predicted an increased risk of other psychiatric outcomes. So, especially, by the way, substance use disorders. So what we're seeing here then is that several predictors from childhood onward are predicting psychiatric disorders at outcome in adulthood in those with ADHD. Having been treated at any point with a stimulant increased risk having higher IQ, decreased risk, and having persistence of ADHD into adulthood, increased risk for other psychiatric outcomes, especially substance use disorders. So uh, there you have it. I hope you found that informative. I certainly did. Our next paper up is one that just sort of fascinated me. So I'm going to talk about it because I've never heard of this before. I don't even know why you would look at this topic, but they did. It's a study from Norway using a huge population database out of Norway that looks at the length of the umbilical cord in newborn babies and their risk over time for neurodevelopmental disorders. And here's what they found. Obviously, you can see here, they were looking at over 858,000 births. And they identified many thousands with ADHD, those with autism spectrum, those with intellectual disability, and those with cerebral palsy. Also, they were looking at epilepsy, vision problems, impaired hearing, and so on. But what they found is that umbilical cord length increased the odds of the individual having ADHD by about 15%, by the way. So it wasn't a big increase, but it is kind of fascinating to see that increased cord length was associated with increased risk for ADHD, whereas decreased cord length was associated with a decreased risk. I don't know why that would be the case. Obviously, cord length may have to do with the degree to which the individual is getting 
nutrition or not maybe excessive cord length impacts this ability to nourish the fetus in the womb. I'm not sure of that. By the way, they did find that short cord length was associated with intellectual disability, impaired hearing, and epilepsy. So, uh, but that's aside from our interest here in ADHD. So there you go. Length of umbilical cord slightly increases the risk of ADHD. My next study up is more practical. This is a study published over in Educational Psychology, and it's on the effects of note-taking and symptoms of ADHD on learning from a lecture. So they took college students who had been oversampled for ADHD, meaning that many more of them had ADHD, than would be the base rate in the college population, but they also had typical college students as well. And they exposed them to a 15-minute TED Talk, and they had some of them doing note-taking by hand, some of them typing notes, and others took no notes, and then they gave them a quiz afterwards. And some of the things they were looking at is fine motor dexterity and handwriting speed and whether or not they used handwriting or typing and so on, as well as ADHD symptoms. But the bottom line of the study, which I think might be of interest to you, is they found that taking notes, whether by hand or typing them onto a laptop, for instance, during the lecture, helped with recall, but especially was useful to those with ADHD symptoms, that is, higher ADHD symptoms. So it looks like note-taking, either by hand or by typing, is preferentially beneficial to helping those with ADHD and their learning. That's something I talk about in my previous videos on low-tech solutions for ADHD. You might want to go back and have a look at that. But here's some empirical evidence for that recommendation for note-taking. And by the way, that would apply as well to people working in employment settings, not just people in college, that if you have to go into a meeting and you need to retain what's being discussed in that meeting, you're better off taking notes if you have ADHD. My last article up comes to us from the journal Addictive Behaviors. This is a study that was done over in Japan. And they talk about Japan is considering increasing the uh, availability of casinos within the country. So that's what kind of initiated this study. And they wanted to look at risk factors for problem gambling in the population, particularly in individuals with ADHD. So they went out and took a large sample from the population, more than 29,000 individuals participated, and here's what they found. About 22% of those with ADHD reported problem gambling. That's pretty consistent with other studies that I've reviewed here that have been done in North America and also elsewhere in Asia, suggesting that people with ADHD have a higher risk of problem gambling. In this case, they found that what pre predicted that was not only the degree of ADHD symptoms or being diagnosed with ADHD, but also the diversity of gambling experiences. That is, the many different kinds of gambling that the individual engaged in increased the risk that they were going to have problem gambling. That makes sense. But they also found especially that it was online casino use that was the strongest predictor of problem gambling in both the typical population and in those with ADHD. So the article goes on to argue that if Japan is going to increase access to casino-related experiences, both in person and online, they might need to develop some targeted intervention strategies for individuals likely to have problem gambling, and that would mean those with ADHD in particular. So that's your Saturday morning research review. Again, I hope you found it informative. Thanks again for answering my survey about the dad jokes. We'll keep them going, but I'll try to limit them to just a few in each video. And as I said before, if you don't like them, just skip them and go straight to the timeline that starts with the first research article. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me this Saturday. And as always, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now.